Well, we're here today at the beautiful Earlswood Lakes. We're going to be doing some autumn bream fishing. It's an unseasonably warm day, but obviously it's very, very welcome. It's very nice for fishing in. We're going to be talking you through the baits, through the approach and the tattle that we use to tattle bream during autumn. Well, as you can imagine at this time of year we need to think about our line choices a little bit more than what we do during the summer in summer months the fish are moving around a little bit more and it's quite often that you can catch on several different lines the water temperature at this time of year is starting to cool down that inevitably means that the generally the water clarity will start to get clearer as well so that's why we need to think about our line selection a little bit more carefully Usually in summer, if I was faced with the peg that I'm faced with today, I could catch as probably as short as 20, 25 metres, but because the water's a little bit cooler, the fish are tending to be a little bit further out into the lake. So I still want to fish two lines because that's going to give me the option of having a resting line, but I want both lines to be further out into that slightly deeper water. So what I've done is I always like to start on my shortest line. So I've decided that my shortest line today is gonna to be 35 meters. So that's gonna be the shortest I'm actually gonna fish. Now, when the water clarity does get a little bit clearer, we are targeting bream today. And as you can imagine, big bream, certainly three, four pound bream, can make a bit of disturbance in your peg when you hook them. They can back off from your main feed area. So with that in mind, I'm gonna have a second line and that's gonna be further out into the lake at 50 meters. So that means I can catch whatever I can catch at 35 meters. If there are loads of fish there and I keep catching, the perfect scenario. However, if it does go quiet and the fish do back off, by putting that 50 meter line out there, it is gonna give a little bit of a refuge area for fish to back off onto. So that means if it does go quiet at 35 meters, I can simply follow them out and go out onto my 50 meter line and try and nick some extra fish. And it could quite possibly just be a case of rotating between the two swims. So now we've decided on the two lines that we're gonna be fishing, let's have a quick look at how I'm gonna kick off the session. Well, at this time of year, I like to keep the bait options pretty simple. What you've got to think about is that, you know, the nights are, are drawing in now, then that is when the temperatures can really drop. So when you arrive at a peg or a swim like this, you never really know what to expect. You know, the fish are starting to slow down in what they are actually eating and they're moving around less as well. So if they're moving around less, generally that means they're eating less. So I keep the bait tray really, really simple. Now the ground bait mix that I'm using in this particular case is a 50-50 mix of, um, it's the Ringer's Dark and Ringer's Natural. It's just a nice fish meal mix. It's fine, there's not much feed in there, and it's just toned down a little bit, and that's the kind of cooler water type mixes that we use for bream at this time of year. We've got the inevitable worms. We are fishing for bream, and we all know how effective worms can be, so you've always got to have worms on your bait tray when you're targeting bream. I've got dead red maggots, fantastic bait all year round, as we know. So they're going to be a great option for feeding and actually putting on the hook as well. So we've got some dead reds. I've also got some pinkies. Now I use these a lot all year round really, but I love to have, these are fluoro pinkies. And as you can see, they're live. Now the reason why they're live is because we've found that on certain hard venues up and down the country, sometimes a live bait during winter can trigger extra fish actually on the hook. Just that little bit of movement can actually catch you extra fish. Doesn't always work but sometimes if you're only after one or two extra fish, it can make a massive difference. We've got some beautiful little red worms. Like I said, again, we are targeting bream and red worms are a fantastic option of a hook bait where we could put multiples on a nice big hook. Most bream love red worms and these are beautiful ones that I've kept for quite a, a few weeks now. So we've got those to try on the hook. And then the final bait on the bait tray is corn. Now this is a bait that I, I use more and more in my bream fishing. Basically because as you can see, it's really, really visual. As the water clarity, um, you know, it gets clearer, it stands out really well on, on the lake bed, on the bottom. But what I also do more and more now in my bream fishing is chop the corn. Okay, so I have a little pot like that, that's a 150 mil pole pot, and I just simply chop the corn as I go, and I add that to my ground bait now. Now I do that for two different reasons. Lots of people use pastachino and that sort of thing in their ground bait when they're bream fishing. Nice little flakes of colour in the ground bait. There are lots of different baits out there and, and versions of that that you can add to your mix. 
However, whilst I love doing that, the one downside to that, in my opinion, is you cannot put those flex on the hook. By chopping corn in this way, you can chop it as fine as you wish. You're adding lovely flex of colour into your ground bait, but you have actually got the option of putting that on the hook. And quite often, I might put a pinky on or two dead red maggots, and you can top it off with a piece or two slices of chopped corn. Just gives it a bit of a cocktail, and that is directly something that is actually in your mix. I'm a massive believer in wherever possible, only introduce baits that you can put on your hook, because on those days when the fish are feeding on that sort of thing, it means it's another option for you to put on the hook and hopefully catch those extra fish. So to kick off the session, I'm going to start at 35 metres, ease my way into the session. We don't know how good or bad it might be, but I'm going to feed that 50 metre line for later on, where if I have got to chase fish out and just have a resting line, then that's the line. So I'm going to kick off at 35 metres. So I'll show you how I'm going to feed both lines. We've had a lovely start to the session. We've caught an early bream, which was very, very welcome. Um, I'm still on that 35 meter line, but it is evident that there are some small roach there as well. There are one or two top in as well, but they are obviously down on the bottom as well. So we kicked off with a little bit of the chopped corn, um, some chopped worm and some dead red maggots on this line. And that's what we kicked off with, just four feederfuls, but there was only two feederfuls with actually any bait in. I didn't want to put too much in because I knew we were starting on this line. Um, and I think we've hooked another bream by the sounds of it. Feels like a bream. So what we did was, because it was evident there were so many small fish there, usually, and in a match, we might have been able to take those roach because some of them are, are a decent stamp. But obviously today is all about bream and on occasions like this, it's really important to try and single out the bream, you know, as long as you're confident they're there. So I've just been ringing the changes with different hook baits. I've gone through bunches of maggots red worms, even tried a piece of corn as well, but the roach are still having a go at it. But I've kept the feed going in, and it's just showing signs that the roach are moving out of the peg a little bit. And this particular cast, I've got four dead red maggots on, and it was evident that this has been able to be in there for probably two minutes without any indication, which can obviously suggest that the roach have moved out of the peg, they've lost interest, or one or two bream are there and move the roach out. So it's another good fish. So we'll just net this one. But it was very evident on this cast that the roach weren't attacking the bait like they were earlier on. There we go, beautiful fish. So I'm hoping now that this peg has kind of slowed down a little bit. I plan on being on this line for at least, you know, at least half an hour or so. I fed the far line, but one thing we need to keep in mind is the roach might be on the long line as well. So the last thing I want to do is find I've got to go onto that line and the roach have mopped up all the bait. So I'm going to top that line up again, just to keep it as a resting line and see if we can catch any more fish like this on that line. But let's just hold him up for you. Another lovely looking bream. Like I say, it was much more evident that we could leave that in place longer on this cast. So I'm hoping that's because some of these are down there on that feed now. <laughs> Stunning fish, very lively. Like I say, on four, four maggots, on a nice, it's a size 14 MXC1 hook. It's a lovely, lovely hook pattern, a wide one. So you can put larger hook baits on, just like what we use when we're targeting bream. But there we go. As you can see, lovely fish. So hopefully some of those have arrived on that line now. So I'm gonna to top that long line up and that'll buy us a little bit more time to focus on this line where hopefully we're gonna have another run of fish. Well, the setup that I'm using today is different for each line. Okay, so the shorter line, which is 35 meters, I'm using the new Horizon Pro X-Class. This is the 3.6 meter version. The weight of this rod or the, the grammage of the rod, because a lot of people ask about that, this is the 60 gram. And this is an ideal length, 3.6 meters ideal for that shorter line. 
However, this will let me go further than that if I did want to chase the fish out. And if the conditions change like they can do on these open water venues, it still means I'm going to be able to reach that range that I'm fishing. I've got that coupled with a Horizon 4000 reel. Really nicely balanced, that reel. You know, it's just nice for this length rod. I've got that with, um, that's fitted with um, 0.10 submerged braid. And I have got a five meter tapered shot leader, one of the Horizon shot leaders on there as well. So it's a really nice, um, it's a durable setup, but it's one that's still nice and soft for playing skimmers and bream. So I've got that, that's the 3.6 meter version that I'm using. I've got a one and a half ounce tip in that. And I decided on this rig, I decided to have it as a free running rig. Okay, now one of the things that I love to do when I'm fishing for bigger bream, certainly grazing bream, ones where we're hoping we've got a better feed down, there are fish grazing on the feed. Line bites can be an issue, certainly when there's lots of fish there, and certainly big fish. I like to slack line wherever I can, so that's why I've opted for a free running rig on this particular setup. So all I've got is a free running feeder, and that is with one of the Matrix feeder links. Okay, so that's just free running. I've got, currently that is a 30 gram side weighted feeder, which are absolutely ideal for this sort of fishing. And in most scenarios, that is the, you know, in my opinion, the best style of feeder to use. It just sits on the bottom really nice. So I've got that free running, and that's then to a feeder bead, which is just pulled onto the line. That feeder stop, it just basically stops the feeder from going any further than that. The beauty about that kind of a bead is these are quite, um, they've got a low diameter so they stay on the, the line really nice and tight. It does allow you to move it as well so if I want to adjust the length of this hook length or this tail then I can do that but because you pull them onto the line as opposed to a stot or a shot you haven't squeezed anything onto the line which can, can create weakness okay so that's a great way of stopping the feeder. Then below that about 10 or 12 centimeters below that I've just got another piece of line it's the same existing piece of line there it's not twizzled it's just a straight piece of line with a loop in it and then I've got my hook length there that is tied loop to loop okay so I've got the micron hook length which is 0.14 and that's to a size 14 MXC1 hook and like I say that's an ideal hook for fishing with bigger baits so that's the shorter line rig okay so that's a free running rig so that means I can simply if I'm getting indications or I just want to sit on my hands more as they used to say and let the bite develop, then a free running rig will allow me to do that because the feeder is actually able to run up and down the line so I can let bites develop. Now on the longer line, because I'm casting further, I'm casting 50 meters, I've got a slightly longer rod. This is the same rod, the Horizon Pro X class, but this is the 3.8 meter, so it's slightly longer. This is 70 gram rated rod, so that'll allow me to easily cast feeders 50 gram and that sort of weight upwards that it's just going to load the rod nicely. So obviously we haven't got severe conditions here, but if they were severe, a 50 gram feeder or so would load this rod ideal and allow me to get out to that 50 meter range. Because this is a slightly longer rod, I've coupled that with a Horizon 5000 reel. And again, that's really nicely balanced with this slightly longer rod. And just like on the other rod, this is 0.10 submerge braid with a shot leader again. All that is the same sort of setup as, as the shorter line. However, the rig that I've got on this line is a rig that I love to use on the longer line and I see lots of people doing it now on lots of different venues and I've actually just got it fixed with a nice simple helicopter type rig okay so all that is is basically just pull one of the feeder beads onto the line then I've got a quick change swivel one of the matrix quick change swivels threaded onto the line and then another bead and that just basically traps that quick change swivel there okay so I can quickly and easily change that hook length you know if I want to alternate hook lengths so that will allow me to do that and because it's like that in a helicopter fashion sometimes we find when we're casting further a lot of people or a lot of rigs are prone to tangling when you're going that little bit further out this kind of a rig is virtually tangle free okay so I've got them that are stopped I've basically got a length of about 10 centimeters twizzled shock leader beneath that and then trapped within the twizzle is a, a matrix um, snap link swivel which obviously means I can quickly and easily just change the style of feeder and that is it that is a really durable rig and the reason why I like that rig on the longer line is because you generally find that when you go out further into a, a reservoir like this we tend to be targeting bigger fish it's very very rare you go that far out for small fish and with those bigger fish you tend to find that the bites are proper bites you've generally got a bit more toe as well when you go out there and having a rig like this just kind of tightens the rig up better 
you're not picking up on every little indication you're generally waiting for bites to develop and that's when this sort of rig it can be ideal on that longer line so that's it two different rigs for two different lines but that's because i planned on fishing the two lines slightly different um, slightly different from each other and like I say, one of the key factors to that longest rig is that it, it's virtually tangle free. The last thing you want to be doing is punching a feeder out there, sat waiting 10, 15, 20 minutes for bites, wondering if your rig's tangled or not. This kind of a rig is going to make sure that it's not tangled. Well, we're fishing two different lines today, two different ranges, and with that in mind, that, as you'd expect, determines the style of feeder that we can use on either line. Now, the shorter line, I'm using the style of feeder that I love to use on most occasions, and that's the side-weighted version of the wire cage feeder. Brilliant feeders, really nice, large surface area of the weight on the bottom, and because they're a fine wire mesh, it means the water can get to the ground bait really nice and quickly, therefore it empties quicker. Now I've got two different sorts of feeder for that line. I've got one for feeding, so that's the one for topping that line up and initially feeding it, and that's a six hole high version. So that means I could put three or four of those in, put quite a bit of volume of bait in, and just set that line up for the initial feed, but also if I want to top it up during the session. So that is a really nice size, it's six hole high. The reason why that is nice as well is because that can easily be cast with my original setup, the normal setup that I'm fishing with. Some people like to use bigger feeders for topping lines up, that's great, but sometimes you can only do that with a, a dedicated special feeding rod. By doing it with a feeder that size means that you can do it with the existing kit that you're fishing with, so it means less tattle setup. And the other thing is it means that you're not putting a big volume of bait in one spot. A big coke can feeder like a lot of people use are great for putting a volume in quickly, but that means that it's putting that bait in one spot. With a little feeder like that, you can still feed the same quantity of bait, but you can put it in, in four different spots, and just spread your bait out a little bit, and that's often what we want to do when we're after grazing fish. You don't want grazing big bream to be on a, on, a, on a sixpence, as they say. You want it to be spread out over a little bit of an area to encourage more fish to be over the feed. So it's a six hole high feeder that I'm feeding with first, and then I've got the four hole high version of the, exactly the same feeder for actually fishing with. It's surprising how much bait you can actually feed with a feeder like that, and it's a little bit more discreet. When the water's a little bit clearer like it is at this time of year, then you just want to be a little bit more discreet about when you're casting your feeder in, okay? So that's the feeder that I will be fishing with on that shorter line. Now the longer line, which is at 50 meters, I've got exactly the same principle, okay? So I've got a feeder for feeding, so that's the feeder that I use to top up that line and to feed it initially. Once again, I've gone down the fine wire cage route, but this is the Horizon style. Again, it's the same size cage as the other one, which is six hole high. And that's because that will, as you can appreciate with the design, it's going to get out there no problem, but it's just a larger quantity of bait that we can feed there quickly. Okay, so that's a six hole high version. Again, it's a wire cage because when you're setting lines up and feeding them, you want to put them in and get the feeder out straight away. You don't want to be waiting 30 seconds or whatever for the, for the ground bait to exit the feeder. You want to empty it quickly. So that style feeder is perfect for doing that. This is a 40 gram version. And then for fishing, just like on the other line, I've got the same style feeder, the Horizon feeder, but it's a smaller version. This is again, it's a four hole high version, 40 gram. It just means I can be a little bit more discreet about when, whilst I'm actually fishing. And one of the key things to when you're setting lines up like this is that if you think about what you're actually doing in the sense that you're putting a bed of feed in, you're doing that where hopefully some fish are going to settle on it so that when you do decide to go on that line after half an hour or an hour, you're hoping there's some fish there. So the last thing you want to do is go and crash a big feeder right in the middle of them because they've been undisturbed for whatever period of time you've left it the last thing you want to do is go and crash a big feeder amongst them and disturb them you want to be nice and discreet just a nice little feeder to plop amongst them because if they are there feeding you don't want to scare them so that's four different feeders but two different styles and that's just why we carry different feeders like we do because each one's got its own purpose so we've got one for feeding on both lines and one for fishing on both lines
Well, this short line's gone a little bit iffy now. I cut back on the feed because we were getting a few indications that we're trying to single out the bream and it's gone a little bit funny now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to top it up. I think it needs a rest and I think we need to have a look on that longer line. So what I'm going to do is I don't like to just leave a line and not feed it or set it up in any way. I've just clipped on the six hole feeder again, the one for feeding. A bit of corn in there, some chop worm. So I'm just basically going to top this line up. Just gonna, I'm only going to put two in on it just to keep it that you know topped up while I check out that 50 meter line because it's important at keeping two lines alive if you possibly can wherever possible you know if you go on catch on one line all day then that's you know the ideal scenario happy days but let's be honest how many how many times does that happen <laughs> so it's always important to try and keep your lines alive there's so many different reasons for that you know I've seen people right up until it could be in the last half hour something drastic could happen or somebody next to you could catch on a short line and if you haven't just spent a minute just to keep your line alive then it can really you know really um, impact your match really it's just about keeping your options open so i'm just going to put two in on this line quite a bit of feed in there and then we're just going to have half an hour on that 50 meter line where hopefully there's going to be some fish waiting for us but if not, by having a second line, not only are you hopefully going to catch a fish when you go on that line, but it's also giving you the option of resting this line as well. So that's why sometimes you might not really think you're going to catch on two lines, but sometimes having two lines can help that way because it's giving you the option to rest one of them. So I haven't got a hook length on this rod yet. I haven't cast out yet. Just a quick tip for you, that has been in the sun today, I haven't touched this for two hours now since I fed it, just wet your braid, it only takes a few seconds, there we go, that's all you need to do, it can just help stop you know, wind knots, some people don't really suffer with that, but with some braids especially, um, it's just better to keep them a bit damp, so all I'm going to do is, I'm clipping the four hole horizon feeder on, because that's the one we're going to be fishing with, where hopefully if there are any fish there waiting for us, that size feeder is going to be a little bit discreet. I've got the quick change swivel so I can quickly and easily put a hook length on. For those that are interested, this is a 70 centimetre hook length. And just another tip for you, for those helicopter rig fans, there are competitions out there that do stipulate 50 centimetre hook length rules. Southfield Reservoir is one of them, a lot of the international rules competitions are the same. Beware, because I've seen people do this and it is actually breaking the rules. As you can see, that hook length is not coming from the bottom of the feeder. I see lots of people put a nice helicopter rig on. They've got a beautifully tied 50 centimetre hook length that they've spent time and care at home tying it up. It's an illegal rig, okay? So if you plan on using a helicopter rig, your hook lengths need to be longer than 50 centimetres because those 50 centimetre rules are from the bottom of the feeder to the hook and as you can see there that's not 50 centimetres so just bear that in mind because you don't want to go getting into trouble so I'm going to kick off with four maggots four reds let's just see what's out there there might be a roach out there like they were on that short line and if that's the case we might have to be more selective with the baits like you know worms or, or corn again but we'll just pop some bait in so if we do get a fish out there first cast, we're going to be leaving a little bit of bait behind and it just means you're kind of setting up your next fish. And you've nothing to lose because if you don't catch anything on this line, well, you've left some bait out there again, which means it's set up for your next visit, you know, if you decide to go back short. So this is 50 metres. Bit of a ripple on the lake now as well, which is nice. Beautiful setup for fishing that range. With this rod, I mean, you saw how easy that was, 50 metres, dead easy. These rods have got a lot more backbone in, in them as well to go much further than that if need be. Ounce and a half tip, bit of a ripple on it, which is nice. And it's to be nice if there's some fish out there waiting for us. Well, it's been a typical example of not really knowing where the fish are going to be and that's that's why we cover our options by putting different lines in 
on reservoirs like this, every time of year it's important that you know you should try and cover different depths if you have got differences in depth with, within your swim and that's what's happened today that 50 meter line has really been it's not been very good at all i've only caught a couple of fish on it no bream on that line at all and very few bites very few indications the main line has been at 35 meters but obviously on another occasion that could have been completely the other way around but that's why we need to cover our options we haven't fed too much but it's you know we've had to ring the changes throughout the day and that's what's really kept fish coming throughout the session we've caught a number of bream which has been brilliant and they've all been a good stamp as well but we've also caught quite a few roach as well which is interesting and that's one of the things that has made us make a few changes to try and be a little bit more selective with the hook baits and that sort of thing so i hope you've found this session of use i hope you've picked up one or two hints and tips that's going to help you in your fishing if you have please give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos i'm going to have a couple more casts hope you've enjoyed the video and i look forward to seeing you all next time